This is the world famous Trump International Hotel and Tower. It's one of the most recognizable buildings in the country and stands out in the Chicago skyline. But despite what some would have you believe, it isn't only popular because it holds one of the most recognizable names in the world. From build issues to floods to this, there's been plenty of reasons that this building has stayed in the news over the past two decades. And even outside of these, it has one of the more visually appealing designs in a construction process that used enough concrete in its foundation alone that a fleet of 30 trucks had to make 600 trips each. The tower is located at 401 North Wabash Avenue, which is on the former site of the Chicago Sun-Times, one of the city's major newspapers. It stands on the north bank of the Chicago River, just west of the Wrigley Building and the Michigan Avenue Bridge. The tower is visible from various parts of the city, including from boats on the river and vantage points like the mouth of Lake Michigan, the Lakeshore Drive overpass, and the Columbus Drive Bridge. Because of this, it's gained a significant amount of popularity and is one of Chicago's most photographed locations. The building was designed by SOM. I've talked about SOM several times before on the channel, and you're probably familiar with some of their work. The building's design incorporates three setback features to ensure visual continuity with the surrounding skyline, each reflecting the height of a nearby structure. The first setback on the east aligns with the cornice line of the Wrigley Building. The second on the west side aligns with River Plaza to the north and Marina City Towers to the west. And the third setback, also on the east side, corresponds with 330 North Wabash, which was formerly IBM Plaza. The setbacks and rounded edges aren't just for looks, they actually help mitigate vortex formation. The building's body is elevated 30 feet above the main Wabash entrance and 70 feet above the Chicago River. The structure's curtain wall has clear glass with a special coating and a curved stainless steel frame that sticks out 9 inches from the glass. It also features brushed stainless steel panels and clear aluminum trim, making it stand out from other skyscrapers, giving it that iconic look. The building spans 2.6 million square feet across 98 stories. From the ground up, the building encompasses retail space, a parking garage, a hotel, and condos. The 3rd to 12th floors house lobbies, retail areas, and the parking garage, while the 17th to 27th floor accommodates hotel condos and executive lounges. Residential condos occupy the 28th to 85th floor, while the 86th to 89th floor contain penthouses. The tower stands at 1,400 feet from the main entrance on Wabash Avenue to the tip of the architectural spire. Upon its completion in 2009, it was the seventh tallest building in the world, just behind the 1,380-foot Jin Mao Tower in Shanghai, China. However, in November of 2009, the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, which ranks the world's tallest skyscrapers, revised its measurement standards. Previously, a building's height was measured from the main entrance to the tip of the spire, while the new standard measured from the lower lowest open-air pedestrian level. Since the Trump Tower has a Riverwalk entrance 27 feet below the Wabash Avenue entrance, its official height was recalculated to 1,388 feet without any physical alterations. This recalculated height made the tower the sixth tallest in the world, surpassing the Jin Mao Tower by a few feet. However, in January of 2010, it returned to being the seventh tallest building with the opening of the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, which is still the world's tallest skyscraper to this day. On October 16th of 2004, Donald Trump and Hollinger International, the parent company of the Chicago Sun-Times, finalized the $73 million sale of the newspaper's former building. On October 28th, Trump held a ceremony to commence the demolition of the old Sun-Times building. The demolition and construction of the new tower were financed by a $650 million loan from Deutsche Bank and three hedge funds. In March 2005, the construction process began with the sinking of the first Kaizen into the bedrock for the tower. By April, work had started on the foundation below the Chicago River. In October of 2005, within a 24-hour period, a fleet of 30 concrete trucks made 600 trips to pour 5,000 cubic yards of concrete, creating a 200 by 66 by 10 foot concrete mat, which served as the building's base. This day was officially referred to by those involved as the Big Pour. The concrete used was made up of a new formula, specified to meet a 10,000 PSI requirement, which well exceeded the standard 7,000 PSI requirement. As an interesting aside, the first season winner of The Apprentice in 2004 was hired to manage the Trump Tower construction project. Though his title was officially marked as president, he was essentially learning on the job as an apprentice. 
James McHugh Construction, the concrete subcontractor, implemented a comprehensive formwork for the building, making it the tallest formwork structure in the world at completion. Using concrete was crucial because a traditional ironwork structure would have required a footprint too large for the property size. Concrete provided the necessary support against wind forces due to the building's 330,000 ton weight. The building's 241 kaizens mostly descend 75 feet into hard clay, with 57 of them extending an additional 35 feet. The concrete spine features five I-beam shaped walls and exterior columns, narrowing to two as the building rises. Each floor is separated by a concrete slab, with stainless steel, glass, and aluminum panels attached. Interestingly, of the $600 million construction budget, approximately $130 million was allocated to concrete alone. The construction also benefited from a major decision by the Chicago Sun-Times. The original 1950 seawall was built to bomb shelter thickness and did not need reconstruction. On August 16, 2008, crews made the final major concrete pour to top off the tower's core, commemorated with an unofficial ceremony, where a yellow crane raised a bucket of concrete and an American flag to the rooftop. And finally, the window completion and spire erection were completed in January of the following year. Finishing this project was quite impressive at the time, considering the nearby Chicago spire project was failing due to financial issues related to the Great Recession. In February of 2008, Trump faced a lawsuit from former Chicago Sun-Times publisher and his daughters for canceling the friends and family condo purchases. The publisher had received a 10% discount on a condo in a reduced deposit, but Trump nullified these sales as property values soared. Additionally, Trump secured loans of almost $800 million from Deutsche Bank in early 2005. Due to slow sales, Trump sought to extend these loans in September of 2008. Deutsche Bank demanded repayment of the $40 million guarantee in November of 2008, leading Trump to sue for an extension and $3 billion in damages. Following this, Deutsche Bank countersued for the guaranteed money. In March of 2009, both parties agreed to suspend litigation to aid the project, and by September of 2010, the loan term was officially extended. In February of 2014, after one round of drink service, three men were denied further service due to their apparent intoxication. As a payback, the three pulled what was intended to be a prank. They set off fire alarms and opened a fifth floor stairwell valve and flooded elevator shafts with thousands of gallons of water, damaging woodwork, electrical circuitry, and marble. The resulting damage was estimated at $700,000, and the three faced felony criminal damage to property charges. And finally, on October 18th of 2020, a man suspended himself from the 16th floor of the tower, demanding to speak to President Trump in the media. After being suspended for 14 hours, the man was taken into custody. And no, he did not get a chance to talk to Trump. I make these videos in my free time, and they take quite a bit of time to create. The best reward you can give me is not to like the video or subscribe, but rather give some feedback to help me improve future videos. I've seen so many YouTube channels fail because they turn away from the audience that make them up, and I'd like to do my best to avoid that as I continue to grow. I've attached a Google form in the description of the video, and I would appreciate it if you can give your honest, anonymous feedback. Either way, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.